Tom Rainer, in his recent book, The Post-Quarantine Church, looks at a number of things that he believes will be different, or will need to be different, as churches reopen, as COVID restrictions are lifted. One of the key things he emphasizes is prayer. <clears throat> in order to be the people God wants us to be, both in seeing ourselves grow and flourish as believers and in effectively reaching the world around us, we need to refocus on prayer. And he points out that the early church thrived because it was a praying church. So how can we effectively pray for fellow believers? I mean, we, we know what to do if they're sick or injured or going through a trial or traveling. But how should we pray for one another on a daily basis? Well, the Bible affords us a number of excellent examples of regular intercessory prayer for believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. Prayer shouldn't be reserved for times of crisis. And it should be more than, Lord, bless so-and-so. So the prayers found in the New Testament letters are great models. Today, we look at Paul's prayer for the church in Philippi. We read, beginning in verse 3 of chapter 1, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So first we have thanksgiving. Paul declares that whenever he thinks of them and prays for them, he thanks God. Now, this was typical of Paul. He was always looking for things he appreciated about an individual or a church. Such an approach would tend to change our praying, I think. The church at Philippi had supported him in his ongoing ministry, and Paul never forgot this. He says it gives him joy, and he thanks God for that partnership. So let us look for the characteristics in others for which we can give thanks to God. And then let's do it. This is something we should particularly do if we're having trouble with a fellow believer. This may help to change our view of them or our attitude toward them. Often when we have conflicts, we focus on all the negative things and fail to appreciate the strengths or positive characteristics of a person. Many years ago, a young woman took a secretarial job with a man who was known to be very critical and hard to work for. In fact, he had gone through many secretaries in just the past year. And after a couple days, she understood why. She was on the verge of quitting, but she needed the job desperately. And so she began praying about it, asking God to help her. And the Lord impressed it upon her heart that she should compliment him or thank him for something each day. Well, the next day, as she endured the overbearing instructions and the short-tempered demands and the critical spirit, she kept looking for something to compliment him on. Finally, she told him how much she liked the tie he was wearing. It was the only thing she could think of. <laughs> was all the reply she received. She kept this up, looking for something each day. Now, at first it was very difficult, and sometimes she failed. 
but gradually she seemed to find that it was easier. And his replies became more genuine. And it seemed he became easier to work for. Well, time went on, and in fact, they grew to love each other and got married. So when you think it might be impossible to think of anything to thank God for in some people, put forth the effort and ask God to help you. And it may surprise you what the Lord will do. And it wouldn't hurt to mention it to the person you're praying for. It may encourage them. Then after giving thanks to God and expressing his love for them, Paul shares with them the prayer that's on his heart. And he prays first that they might grow in love. Now for many in our society, the word love has just become a word to describe a feeling of warmth toward another or a sexual attraction. People talk about falling in love and out of love. But this doesn't describe the love that Paul has in mind here. The Greek language has four words for love. And Paul uses the word agape here. It's God's love within us, enabling us to love others. It is a self-giving, sacrificial love, such as Christ demonstrated when he died on the cross for us. It is a love that prompts us to help others in need when there's no return in it for us. It is the love that is committed to others, not based on or swayed by feelings. Agape love is that love that is shown by the father and the prodigal son when he runs to meet the returning prodigal and when he reaches out to the elder brother. It is the love shown by Stephen as he has been stoned to death when he prays for his persecutors, saying, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. This love is founded upon and grows through an adequate and correct knowledge of God's word. Paul knows that a person's love strengthens as they grow in the knowledge of things spiritual. Without actually stating it, Paul is praying that they might come to know the Bible better, not just factually, but in their hearts as well. And secondly, He's praying that this love be based on discernment or depth of insight. In other words, this kind of love is not blind. Paul prays that their love might grow so that they can discern between truth and error. He's praying that they might have insight into the practical outworking of that love. Insight into where people are at spiritually so they can more effectively share the gospel and have insight into the feelings and needs of others so that they might minister to them effectively. So from Paul's example, one of the greatest things we can do for each other is pray that we might grow in love. Paul continues his prayer so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. So God calls us to a life of holiness. And a key factor in living a holy life is being able to discern what is best. This means to give careful consideration and examination to something. For example, if one makes an investment in a house, we would look at the house, we would ask questions about it, about the age of the roof or the furnace, we would find out if it has any significant problems, we might look at the neighborhood to determine if it's a safe and quiet area. We want to make sure that there are no surprises that would disappoint us or require expensive repairs before we invest our money. So also in our walk with Christ, we should seek God's help in discerning the various situations and what actions are consistent with a life of holiness. Notice, Paul prays that they might discern what is best. Many times we face choices that are not necessarily between good and bad, but between what is good and what is better and what is best. For example, recently we decided it was time to replace our aging vehicle. So we prayed 
to the Lord for wisdom and guidance. We did some research. We looked at what we felt were the essential things that we needed in a vehicle. We believed um, that, you know, there were certain things uh, that were important because we wanted to make some longer trips to visit family and so on. Then we visited several dealerships. We asked questions. We did some test drives. We got more information and finally made our decision. Now, while we are happy with our choice, that doesn't mean the vehicles that we didn't buy were bad vehicles. It's just that the one we did buy, we felt was best for us in our situation. So, for example, we didn't get the Corvette. Well, so when we pray, we may ask the Lord to help us to discern, you know, should I pray for my sick neighbor or should I go visit them as well? Should I spend the day working on my hobby or should I go to a family outing? Should I give a donation to organization A or should I give it to organization B? And so on. So once we allow God to guide us in discerning what is best, then we can be pure and blameless. Now the Greek word for pure is eilakrines. Isla meaning sunbeam and krino, which means to judge from the custom of testing purity by the sunbeam. You see, in the first century, fine pottery would bring a high price, but was also fragile both before and after firing. And many times this pottery would crack in the oven. Now dishonest dealers were in the habit of filling in those cracks with a hard pearly wax that would blend in with the color of the pottery. This made the cracks virtually undetectable unless held up to the light, especially sunlight. In that case, the cracks would show up darker. Hence, the purity of the pottery was tested by means of eilacrines. Honest dealers would often mark their product with a Latin phrase, sine cara, which meant without wax, hence sincere or pure. It's a word we get our word sincere from. So Paul is praying that believers will avoid hypocrisy. Now the final aspect of Paul's prayer comes from a life of love and purity, and that is fruit, where he prays filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus. So what is the fruit of righteousness? Well, there are two things that come to mind as a product of a righteous life. First is fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. As we grow in love and purity, then this fruit of the Spirit should be displayed more and more in our lives. And so we should pray for one another that the joy of Christ will be evident in our lives, that in the midst of trials and struggles and disappointments of life, joy and peace would fill our lives. Should we not pray that God would grant patience to fellow believers, whether it be dealing with government bureaucracy or that annoying neighbor or the traffic on the roads or maybe with us? Similarly, we should pray that kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control be added in growing measure in our lives. And if you struggle to be patient or to be kind in some circumstances, or if self-control is a challenge, why not ask your brothers and sisters to pray for you, asking the Lord to help you in those areas? And then, Another aspect of the fruit of righteousness is a servant's heart, a willingness to serve both God and our fellow man. And this will show itself in different ways because 
God gives each of us differing gifts. For some, it may be demonstrated in working with children. For others, it might be taking care of the handyman jobs. In the church, it might be, you know, helping with the, uh, the maintenance of the building. Or you might be helping a friend or neighbor with chores. Or it could be that some would serve by caring for the sick or visiting others or volunteering in a nursing home or helping out in a homeless shelter. For some, it, it might be that they help by passing on their skills to the disadvantaged, enabling them to have a chance at the job. Really, the possibilities of fruit of service are, are endless. It's using the giftedness that God has given to each of us to serve him and bring glory to his name. But we need to pray for one another that we would develop those gifts and use them. And so here we have a lesson in prayer. We learn that we should pray for each other, starting by giving thanks for our brothers and sisters. That we should ask God to help them grow in love for God and for others. We should pray that they might grow in discernment and purity. We should pray that their lives might be filled with the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of service to God and others. Now imagine how God's power could be released in our midst if we prayed regularly for one another in this way. Imagine how we would grow in faith. Imagine how God would be glorified. Well, let us pray for one another.